John? How you doing over here? Pretty good. You about ready to go? Yeah. I'll... Let me check mm -hmm. your harness. Make sure it's double back. Yeah, that looks good. These are too. This is gonna be a little bit harder than anything you've done before, but I think you're gonna be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> how you feeling? <laughs> I think I'll be able to. Life can have its twists, turns, highs, and lows as you search for the right person to marry. What do you do when you're involved with someone, but for you, it's over? What if the other person is the one who's leaving? Psychologist and best-selling author Dr. James Dobson shares how to maintain dignity and show courage and confidence in relationships. In this session at the Glen Erie Conference Center in Colorado Springs, Dr. Dobson tells why love must be tough. I want to talk to you today about uh, romantic relationships and about uh, principles of marriage, good marriage. And that is uh, highly relevant to you guys, of course, because uh, the chances are very great. Within five to seven years, most of you will be married. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what goes into a good marriage. Some of it will be autobiographical because it will relate to uh, my marriage to Shirley. Uh, I'm very blessed, and you've already met her, and you know that. She's a great lady, have a very good marriage. Not a perfect marriage. Not perfect, because Shirley's not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we have, uh, have had a great relationship and a great marriage. We do have a little tiff every now and then. Little, little conflict every once in a while because, uh, you know, nobody gets away without that. And we've had our, our share of it through the years. We had, a, uh, we had a little fight right here in Colorado a few years ago. We uh, had gone skiing in Vail together. And um, we had spent about six or seven days together, day and night. And we had a little bit too much togetherness. You know what that means? It's when you've You've just about worn each other's nerves out. A healthy relationship is one that breathes like this. You move out a little bit, and you come back together. And you move out, and you come back together. And uh, we'd been together a little too long. We were starting to get on each other's nerves. And we'd had a great time, but it was time to go home. And uh, so we got up in the morning. We had to catch a plane in Denver, and we were in a big hurry. And we threw the stuff in the car, and we had a couple of little arguments in the process of doing that. And we headed down the highway, and we got to Stapleton Airport uh, here in Denver. Bad snowstorm. I mean, the wind was blowing, and, and it was cold. Shirley didn't like the cold. And I pulled the car up there. It was a rental car, and I had to turn it in. So I pulled it up there to take the stuff out. And I mean, we were just going to barely make that plane. And my sweet wife 
you know, instead of helping me get all that stuff out of the car, gets out, goes in the airport, and stands looking at me through the window. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting this stuff out, and there's two sets of skis and two sets of poles and three suitcases and four parkas and all that stuff. And the more I thought about that, the matter I got about it. Now, it was an immature response on my part, but here she is in the warm building, and I'm out there, and we're late, and I'm trying to carry all this stuff, and I couldn't wait to tell her how I felt about that. <laughs> so finally, I got all the stuff out, and then I started taking it in. I carried it in, and I'm demonstrating to her how I felt, and I'd, I'd set it down at her feet, and I'd go back and get another load. And I was just waiting for the opportunity to really express myself. Finally got it all in there. And I walked into the airport, and I sucked in a big breath of air to tell Shirley how I felt about her not helping me when we were late and everything. And before I could say a word, at that precise moment, I heard a cheery little voice behind me. And I turned around, and there was a man there and had his hand stuck out to me like this. And he said, Dr. Dobson, I want to meet the man who's taught me how to really love my wife. <laughs> I never choked it down so much in my life. I, I said, uh, I'd like you to meet my bride here. And uh, so uh, I do have to be uh, kind of careful these days. I can't even get mad in public anymore or even irritated. But there, there are those moments. Now, not very many for Shirley and me. We've come to the point that, that those uh, power plays that you have in the early days of marriage, which are very typical, are essentially over, and we go weeks and months without having a real disagreement or a real argument. But I do have to tell you, we started out on a pretty bumpy trail back many years ago. Uh, we met when we were in college. I was a senior at the time, and Shirley was a sophomore. I was a big, lofty senior. I was a big man on campus, and she was a new kid on the block. And she will tell you today, and, and it's, it's true, it's no insult, it's true, that that she cared more about the relationship uh, in those early days than I did. Uh, I had other things on my mind. I was heading to graduate school, and, and I had all this senior activity and everything, and I felt like a big shot. And I, I didn't really care a whole lot whether the relationship with Shirley developed or not. And I held that relationship very lightly, primarily because there was not a great challenge there. In other words, I knew Shirley... Uh, liked me. I knew she might even love me as we went on a little bit. And for that reason, I held it uh, loosely. Uh, and Shirley was always too proud to pursue me, but she was the one. You know, there are ways of communicating who cares. Well, it came down to my graduation, and uh, I got uh, pulled into the Army. And so the night before I left uh, for the Army, those are the days, guys, when you served, whether you wanted to or not, and I got classified in 1A, so I was off to Fort Ord, California to go to the Army. And uh, I went up there, and then I came back after about three months, and uh, I felt I just really needed to cut Shirley loose. I felt that I was going to tie her up, and I didn't think I was going to marry her. I didn't think I loved her, and I liked her a lot, and we had a good time together, but I just didn't think it was going to work, and I didn't think it was fair for me to be off there in the Army and her to wait for me. So we had a great time. It was New Year's Eve. Had a great time together. We came back, and we were sitting out in the car in front of uh, her dorm, and I broke the news. And I said, Shirley, uh, you know, I, I really care about you a lot. We've had two years of, of great fun here, and we've just built a relationship and everything. But I think it's only fair to tell you that I don't think I'm going to marry you, and I think that we better date somebody else. You know what that means, right? That's, that's uh, cutting the cord. Uh, Shirley handled that in such a beautiful way that I tell you, if she had not been so wise in the way she responded at that moment, we would not be married today. Everything was on the line at that moment. And she said to me, well, you know, Jim, I've been thinking the same thing. Uh, she said, there are other guys that I want to date, and, uh, you know, you're gone, and uh, I think it's probably wise. Why don't we just do that? And I was shocked, really. I thought she was going to hang on me, you know, and, and <laughs> I thought she was going to say, uh, you know, can't we work something out, and uh, will you write me, and all that stuff. She just accepted it. 
And uh, I went around, opened the door, and I walked her to the dorm. I said, can I kiss you goodbye? And she said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and she went in the dorm and cried all night. But I never knew that. If I had known that, it would have been over. She let me go with such poise and such respect and such dignity that the whole relationship changed. And instead of me saying, how can I get away? I began asking myself, do I really want to go? Which is a very different question. So I went on through the Army. I came back and I went into graduate school at uh, USC. By this time, Shirley's a big woman on campus and I'm a forgotten has-been. And Shirley begins to look very good to me. Um, by that time, she was uh, the senior class president, and she was homecoming queen, and she was doing all this stuff, and boy, she was really in the thick of it, and there were guys all around, and she was you know, off to this party and that, and doing all kinds of stuff. And I began to want her a whole lot. And so what I began to do was play the role she had played when I was a senior and she was a sophomore. So I'm calling her on the phone, and I'm saying, did you go to the senior class party last night, and who'd you go with, and who was there, and who walked you home, and uh, why weren't you there when I called, and you didn't return my call, and <laughs> yes, I, I, was, I was chasing her, and I was beginning to, to take the challenge away from her, and I was beginning to be the one that was conveying to her that I needed her a whole lot and probably more than she needed me and I'm telling you she was just walking away from me I was losing her day by day and the more I lost her the more desperately I wanted her and that made me reach for her more so I got to thinking about that and I, I pulled off someplace for a couple of hours sat at a desk and I thought that whole thing over and for two hours, I analyzed what had gone wrong. I had that woman eating out of my hand. She was wrapped around my little finger. And now, you know, she didn't seem to want to give me the time of day. And folks, it hit me. i had been praying about it, think the Lord told me. I saw that I was behaving in ways that were disrespectful to me. I was starting to grovel a little bit. I was starting to chase her. I was starting to remove the challenge and I was treating myself with disrespect. And it just like turned on a light bulb, I saw what was turning her off. So I sat down and made myself a little list, and I listed 10 things that were going to be different. And I said, I'm going to be independent and secure and confident, and I'm going to do all this stuff. Especially, I'm going to convey to Shirley one way or another that I'm going someplace in life, and uh, if she wants to go with me, I'd love to have her make the trip, but if she doesn't want to go, somebody else will. And so I was just going to be very secure and very independent. We had a date on Valentine's Day about two days later. And it was the first time that I tried out my new 10-point philosophy. Worked like a charm. <laughs> I mean, you can't believe. I, all night long, you know, I was, I was not rude. I didn't argue or anything. But I was just sort of in my own world and just sort of confident and, and just I wasn't reaching for Shirley like I had been. And on the way home from the restaurant, took her out to a nice restaurant. On the way home, we were driving along. She was sitting next to her door over here and I was sitting next to this one. We weren't talking very much. All of a sudden, she comes scooting across the seat <laughs> right up next to me and she said, will you pull over and stop? I was glad to do that. So. <laughs> I, <laughs> I pulled over and stopped, and there was bright moonlight that night, and uh, she said, uh, I'm afraid I'm losing you, and I don't know why. I said, uh, <laughs> I said, well, uh, you know, I gave her a little speech. I said, you know, I'm going somewhere in life, and uh, <laughs> I, I hope you choose to go with me. And, uh, and we were married several months later. Those were two key moments in our relationship. One where I put the test on the relationship and she passed it. And the second one is where I played the right role with her and I passed the test. And that brought us together. Now, I learned something from that 
that I have also seen demonstrated with other people earlier in life, but also, folks, in 500 counseling situations that have come from it. That simple concept is the basis for a book that I wrote called Love Must Be Tough. That's now sold 800,000 copies in hardback. I get letters on this book nearly every day from people who understand some principles of romantic relationships growing out of what I just told you that they didn't understand before. The main thing is this. Well, let me put it on the board. Respect is the fundamental ingredient in romantic relationships. Respect precedes love. And you cannot build respect when you are treating yourself disrespectfully, when you're grabbing and holding another person. Now listen carefully, because this is a principle, if you understand, it will play a role from this point on the rest of your life. But I do tell you, it's hard to grasp. It's hard to get a hold of. It took a whole book for me to explain it. Respect is the fundamental ingredient because you want in romantic relationships essentially what you can't have. You don't want what you're stuck with. You don't want someone who grabs, who builds a cage around you and who begs and pleads and cringes in fear, who grovels. You know what the word groveling means? It means get down in the dirt and crawl. Now see, when one person is uh, highly attracted to another and it's not mutual, the natural tendency is, is to grab, it's to plead, it's to beg. It's uh, what Shirley would have done wrong if in the car at that time she'd said, you're my whole life, I love you. I don't love anybody else but you. You can't do this to me. You can't leave me. If you do this, what will I do? And to cry and to come hold me. If she'd have done that, see, she would have built a cage around me. And love must be free. You cannot build a love relationship out of an obligatory kind of situation where you can't get away, where you're trapped, where you're held together. Romantic love requires a certain respect and a certain freedom. Um, I don't know if you've ever read any of uh, Jack London's books, but uh, he wrote Call of the Wild and a number of others. One of the, the most interesting short stories I've ever read was a, a little short story called To Build a Fire. Anybody ever read that? Oh, you've read it. You, you know the story. For the benefit of those who haven't, this man got caught uh, out in Alaska and the temperature went down lower than even uh, was typical for winter time and it was 70, 80, 90 degrees below zero and, and he would spit and, and the spit would crackle into ice before it hit the ground. It was that cold and, and he got trapped and he couldn't get back to the house. He had three matches as I recall and, and if he couldn't light this fire with those three matches then he'd freeze to death and uh, the wind blew out the first two and finally, with the third match, he got a little flame going. The wind was blowing, but he, he got a little flame going, and it looked like it was going to catch hold, and he was going to make it. And at that moment, the snow fell off a limb up above and snuffed out the fire. When you grab and hold another person, you take the little spark that's there, and you snuff it out. And when you behave in ways that are not respectful, you destroy what was a romantic relationship. I heard of a man who was desperate to uh, marry a woman that he loved, and she wouldn't have anything to do with him, so he decided to start writing her letters. And over a two-year period, he wrote her 700 letters, and she married the postman. <laughs> it works that way. The harder you try, the more you reach, the more the other person is uh, driven away. Before Shirley and I developed a, a uh, relationship, uh, she told me about a friend that she had in high school named Stanley. And Stanley was, was a guy with a lot of needs. And uh, Shirley decided that 
that she really didn't want to go with Stanley anymore. And so she was going to cut him free. And they had a similar moment like we had in the car out in front of the dorm where, uh, you know, he's riding along in his uh, chopped down Chevy and, and with the Angora dice hanging from the rearview mirror. <laughs> in those days, they had these dice that, that guys hung from the mirror. And so they went out and parked someplace, and she told Stanley that, that she was through and, and that, uh, that she wasn't going to be able to go out with him anymore. Stanley slinks down in the seat, and he doesn't say anything for about five minutes. He's obviously very upset. And he gets out of the car and takes off, leaves. Surely doesn't know where he's going. Didn't say anything. Stanley's gone. She's sitting there in the dark about 15 minutes. Finally, Stanley came back with a handkerchief around his hand. And it was all bloody. Stanley had gone out there someplace and hit a tree. Just <laughs> socked a tree. Now, folks, did that draw her towards Stanley? Did that, did that make her want to continue the relationship? I mean... Who wants to go with a guy who gets frustrated and socks trees, you know? <laughs> See, Stanley was disrespectful to himself. Instead of letting her go and allowing that little spark to grow, he tried desperately to hold her, and he snuffed out the flame. And it works that way. The challenge is important, and respect is important, and again, the, the respect for yourself is extremely important. I'm not talking about pride. I'm just talking about dignity. That's a better word, dignity. You can only marry one person in a lifetime. At least that's the way it's intended. And you don't marry somebody who is demanding that you marry them. Or you don't continue with them. You do that because you want to. So love must be free. It's sort of like a, a little yellow bird. If you hold it too tightly, it will die. If you hold it too loosely, it will fly away. And those that succeed in relationships between men and women are those that learn how to hold the bird. Now, this is the point that I would like you to understand, and I don't think, uh, I don't think many marital couples, many people who are married, fully understand this. Getting married does not change this relationship. It is still the same. Even in marriage, there must be a certain dignity. There must be a certain respect. Respect begins to die usually in one person, and confidence begins to die in the other. All right, let, let me give you an example. You've got uh, uh, Jack, and he's thinking about his wife. He didn't say this. This is not the kind of thing you say to anybody. He says about his wife. To himself. He says, you know, uh, I used to think she was pretty. Not pretty anymore. She gained 15 pounds after the babies came. She just never looked right again. I'm embarrassed. She's dowdy. I take her to the office. I really don't want the guys at the office to meet her. You know, and she, this house is disorganized. I don't think she's really very bright. Either start thinking those kind of thoughts. Or, or Joan may be thinking about Jack. Look at him lying there on the couch asleep with his mouth open. <laughs> just, just look at him. The guy's going nowhere and he's taking me with him. You know, he's, he's got no future. He doesn't care. There's no romantic aspect to our relationship. And I am stuck with this man for the rest of my life. There's a key point. Marriages begin to disintegrate when one party, usually, begins to feel trapped. There's a cage around them. I am stuck in this situation. Now, I want to give you a very simple little illustration. You have a man and a woman who pledge themselves to be married forever to love one another and to stay married to each other side by side for the rest of their lives. And so they go into marriage like this. But in that moment that I just described where respect begins to die, what happens is that one of the two begins to drift. It's usually only one. 
That's why there's usually only one member of the marriage that wants to uh, come to marriage counseling. The other one doesn't want to come because he's really not interested in it. He already feels trapped, and the counselor is going to try to put it back together. So there's a drifting. Some of you are in dating relationships right now, and you, you're probably thinking, I'm the drifter, or the person I'm going with is a drifter. You know who it is. A gap is opened up. Now, in marriage, that gap is highly threatening and disturbing to this person because they can feel it. I mean, there, there are things that ought to be said when you pass in the hall or when you get up in the morning or the last thing before you go to bed at night. And those things are not said. And the person doesn't reach for you, doesn't touch you, doesn't do nice things for you, doesn't communicate that need, and, and you feel it. So the gap is opened up. Now, what is the, the natural, unthoughtful thing for this person to do? Follow. So that's what happens. Typically, this person comes racing after him. All right? And that closes the gap again. How does this one react to that? Yeah, he moved away because he needed space. Could be a man or a woman. And therefore, he moves again. And then this one's a little more desperate and begins to move farther. I tell you folks, in marriage counseling, that is the typical scene. Right there. It happens. Every marriage counselor alive has seen this. And you got the second person going. Now, this person is starting to panic. Panic leads to appeasement. If you studied World War II, this is why we did to Adolf Hitler. He's taken one country right after another, and we're trying to, to make peace with him. And Neville Chamberlain, the prime minister of, of uh, England, is saying, peace in our time. Let's don't irritate Herr Hitler. See, appeasement never draws a person towards you. It always sends them the other way. Now, I talk to people in marriage counseling in that situation where a wife is so panicked that she's going to lose her husband in a moment like that, that she'll actually allow him to have other women or even bring them into the bedroom. That's not uncommon. She knows that he has other women, but she'd rather have him with a number than not have him at all. And so she begins to permit things. Does that draw him back? No, because it violates respect. He's being disrespectful to her, and she's tolerating it. She's groveling. And again, it could be masculine and feminine. I'm not, not saying it's all one way. All right, so this hand over here is, is chasing the other one, and it reaches a point as they move away where the panic is so great that this one grabs and holds, loses the confidence, and begins to, to smother the other person and beg for their attention and plead for them not to leave. And that's the ultimate disrespect. And the relationship is usually dead at that moment. Just as it would have been with Shirley in the car on that uh, occasion, you see, what she really did, I, I pulled out here. What'd she do? She went this way. What'd that do to me? Brought me back. I can't tell you why it works that way. I don't know why we are constructed like we are, but that's the way it often works. When you've got one that pulls out here, the best thing this one can do is pull this way. Why? Because it communicates to this one, you are free. You're not trapped. You're not obligated. You're here of your own free will. Not only can you get away, but maybe that's best. I'm only half the relationship. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that the, the person who is, who is the rejectee in a marriage say, well, it doesn't matter. Let's just forget the marriage. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that they say to the other partner, you married me of your own free will. I couldn't have forced it. There's nothing I could have done to make you marry me. Legally, physically, emotionally, no way I could have made you marry me. You married me because you wanted to. And you will stay married to me because you want to and not because I force you. I'm only half of that equation. Now, as for me, I'm committed forever because when God joined us together, he made us one flesh. And I'm here for the duration. But I can only make up my mind. I can't make up yours. And you're going to have to do it. But in the case of infidelity, you will only have one. 
That's me. I can't tolerate a number of other people. I can't be a member of a harem. You're treating yourself respectfully. I'm not suggesting that you scream, that you throw things, that you become angry, and that sort of thing. I am suggesting that you maintain a respectful relationship because love must be free. It has to be. God did not force you to love Him. Do you realize He could have done that? Uh, there are birds out there outside this window that the Lord put programmed behavior in, and they'll build the same kind of nest that 40 generations before them, 400 generations before them built, because they don't have any choice. It's wired in. He gave us no instinctual behavior. Man has no instincts. He wants us to love him, but love must be free. He will not force himself on you. He respects your free will, your choice. And you can relate to him or not. So love must be free. Love must be tough, which is what I was trying to say here. There are times when you have to say the tough thing. And love really does have to be confident as well. Because the lack of confidence that produces panic and appeasement produces divorce and disaster. Do you understand that? Does that come through? Let me hear your, your perspectives on it, or your questions on it. Yes? What if you're the one that is drifting away? Like if you're the spouse that is drifting away, how do you regain respect for your spouse? That's where commitment comes in. That's where you have to come back to your vows. The feeling component of a relationship is important, but it is the caboose on the train. It won't pull the train. What's the engine? Commitment. Commitment. See, commitment is the engine. The commitment says, we're going to make it work. And whether I ever feel anything again or not, we're going to make it work, and we're going to put what we have to into this relationship. And I've seen God take those situations and just completely restore the respect and the relationship between a husband and wife. But that, that is a difficult one right there. What are some guidelines to know where to draw the line between showing a person that you care about them and actually chasing them? It really needs to be something that you feel way down here. You know, when you are groveling, you really do know it. Uh, when it's not matched on the other side, when the other person is not communicating the same things back, when you find yourself uh, doing a lot of worrying and your hands get sweaty when you think about the relationship and when your heart thumps a little bit because you believe you might be uh, losing them. Someone said, if you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't come back, it never was yours in the first place. Uh, we had some problems with, uh, with coyotes around our house in uh, Los Angeles. We lived in the foothills uh, there in Los Angeles. And these coyotes would come down at night and rob the trash cans and just create a nuisance. And uh, they killed a little dog two doors up from us. And uh, they were just all over the place for a period of time. And I looked out the window one morning, and there was a, a, a little pup, a coyote pup, trotting down the middle of the road with his ears sticking up. And he's, he looked so cute. He's, he was about this tall, maybe about eight weeks old. And so I ran out there, and I got behind him, and I managed to run him into my backyard. And I closed the gate, and I had him back there. Then it took me about an hour and a half to trap him. I chased him all over the place, and I got a butterfly net, and I finally got that over his head and kind of pinned him so that he couldn't bite me, and then I put a collar on him and a leash, and I had me a coyote pup on a leash. <laughs> and he went absolutely bananas because everything his mama had told him about people had come true, you know. <laughs> and he is leaping and jerking and biting at that leash and trying to get free. And uh, I had him back there in the backyard uh, through the morning, and, and I tried to feed him, and he wouldn't eat, and tried to give him water, and he wouldn't drink. And uh, I brought in the neighbor kids, and they were all fascinated with him. We just, we just had fun with him through the day. I thought about making a pet out of him, so I, I called my father, who knows uh, a lot about wild animals, and I, I said, can I ever tame this coyote pup? Can I ever make him my own? Can I ever take the wild out of him because he was... He was raised to this degree in the wild. 
And my dad says, you really never will. Now, you'll get him where he won't bite you, and you'll get him where he'll live there. But he will never really be yours. He will always have the wild streak in him. And to some degree, he will always be your captive. And about 5 o'clock that afternoon, I called the Department of Fish and Game. They came and they picked him up and they took him up in the mountains and they let him go. Why? Why didn't I keep him? Because he wasn't mine. I would have kept him under protest. I couldn't love him because he would not have been there of his own free will. Love must be free. And I turned him loose. If you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't come back, you never owned it at all. That is very true in romantic relationships before marriage and after. Question right there. What are some precautions that we can take as teenagers in our dating lives so that we can make sure we have safe marriages? First of all, I think it's very important to understand the differences between males and females, the radical differences between the sexes. Uh, we've been told in the last 15 to 20 years that males and females are identical except for the ability to bear children. And that is absolute nonsense. That's foolish. God made two sexes, male and female, created he them. Male and female. And he made us radically different. And it's in that difference that the beauty and the complexity of the human personality comes together because it's when the two of them are expressed together that you have completeness and you have wholeness. Uh, males and females are different in uh, the way they respond socially. They're different psychologically. They're different emotionally. They're different sexually. Uh, they're different uh, literally in every cell of their body because they carry a different chromosomal pattern. You can change the way they look, and you can grow the hair different, and you can put lipstick on, and you can change a few things. You can't change masculinity and femininity because it's locked into every cell of the body. You can't change that. We are very different creatures. I uh, saw a study done uh, some time ago of students your age. They actually went on the uh, campuses of various uh, high schools. They just observed young people who were there who didn't know that they were being watched. And they found all kinds of differences that, that people aren't even aware of. For example, the guys tend to carry their books uh, at their side like this, right? The girls cradle them to their breasts in much the same way they would a baby. They're not aware of this. It's just a subtle difference. Uh, women are far more viable. They have a, a tighter grip on life than men do. Do you know that there are 140 male babies conceived for every 100 females? By the time birth occurs, the ratio has dropped to 106 or 105 to 100 in favor of males. Why is that? What happened to the rest of them? Well, they spontaneously aborted. Males do not thrive as much as females do. They have lactation or breastfeeding. They have pregnancy. That makes a difference emotionally. So we're very different. Now, going back to something that was asked earlier, one of the primary ways that we're different has to do with this need for romantic involvement. You must understand that men and women see that differently. Men can be very contented in a marital relationship uh, or in a romantic relationship where there's really not a lot of emotional content with the other person, where there is um, a, just a kind, as I said before, a kind of a business partnership. And that drives a woman crazy. Uh, for one thing, women need to talk more than men do. And that comes as a bulletin, didn't it? I mean, you're really surprised to find that out, aren't you? That women, that girls talk earlier than guys, they talk better than guys, and they talk more than guys uh, in, coming through the preschool years. They just are more verbal. Someone said that, uh, that women may have a need to express 50,000 words per day, and the men may have a need to express 25,000. So he comes home from work with his 25,000 spent, and she still has 25,000. She's dying to get said. <laughs> and, and he's grunting and groaning and not really engaging in her. To the guys who are here, 
I strongly suggest that both in dating and in your romantic relationships after marriage, that you maintain that oneness, that closeness. It's not enough to simply earn a living for your family, uh, to be faithful to your wife, to meet the needs of your children. Something greater is needed. And that's that romantic aspect because your wives are going to need it. And counselors like myself, hear that over and over and over again uh, in counseling, that women are frustrated. Now, to the women who are here, let me say that your husbands can never be what you fully want them to be. They're not made like you. A man can't talk to you like another woman can talk to you. A man can't meet all of your needs. And I think American women have a tendency to expect too much from their men and too much from marriage. So they go in with this high level of expectation that it's just going to be, you know, a rose-covered cottage and they're going to laugh and they're going to romp and they're going to have a good time and they're just going to go through life and it's all going to be so romantic. And then it turns out to be a lot of hard work. You know, and most of life is getting the chores done and going to work and cleaning the garage and vacuuming the floor and wiping snotty noses of kids and changing diapers and a whole lot of it is like that. Then it's not what she thought it was going to be. And if you go into marriage with that expectation, you're going to be agitated and you're going to be mad at him. But it's the way it is. So lower your expectations. And guys, do what you can to meet them. It's a pretty good combination. Anybody want to comment on that? Yes. Um, well, I tried all of those things with a past relationship. And I was just wondering, um, since we do talk more, um, we should, I think we should initiate the conversation. And when we try and they don't talk, what do you do then? Well, you first of all, you have a, a pretty good taste of reality of what life is going to be like uh, if you choose to marry that person because uh, some guys are even less verbal than others. You know what I've found is that uh, some women are drawn to the strong, silent type. I mean, that's the reason they like the guy is that that they're emotional and up and down and they get all excited and they get depressed and everything and he's steady and he's solid and he's quiet and he's, he's in control and everything. So they're drawn to him and then they chew him up for the next 50 years because he won't talk to them. <laughs> but what you see is what you get. And when you're dealing with a guy in the dating relationship who simply can't communicate and won't communicate... Understand that as you take the relationship further because that's who he is. And he's going to have to do that for you too. You know, there are things about you that will bother him. And you guys just have to decide whether or not you can live with that because you don't change people a whole lot. They don't change a lot after marriage. Did you know, folks, that research shows, and this, this is classic research done by two surgeons named Penfield and Rasmussen, if you ever get a chance to read this research, it's really very interesting. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, they were neurosurgeons who had to do surgery on people with them conscious. In other words, they would open the brain and they would be doing neural surgery with the patient semi-conscious. And they found that when they touched a little electrode to various parts of the brain, the people experienced an earlier episode of their lives in living color just as though it had originally happened. They touch it here and all of a sudden he's five years old and it's a birthday party and the aunt comes in and everybody sings and he relives that. Your memories are locked in there. No one knows how. It's chemically coated on the nerve endings apparently but it's all there. And so you're a product of those things that have brought you to this moment. And those don't change very much. Now, I'm not saying you can't change bad behavior and God can't make you a new creature and, and all that sort of thing. But these, these personality characteristics go into marriage with your eyes wide open. Somebody said you should keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half closed thereafter. And that's, that's pretty good advice right there. Should you confront your spouse or your girlfriend with a lot of the pet peeves or some things that get on your nerves, you know? Because I'm thinking that you don't want bitterness to build up inside. You just said to talk to pastors and friends or whatever. But 
If you can do it in a tactful and loving way, is that... Is yeah, that? you know what? You have dealt with a, a chapter in Love Must Be Tough because I, I talk about... Talk about defending the line of respect. If uh, Shirley is going to fix a big dinner for me tonight, and I know that, and it's, uh, it's our anniversary, it's a special time, and I know she's gone to the store and she's working on this big dinner, it's a candlelight thing, and I'm working at my office and I get interested in what I'm doing, and I don't call her, and I come home an hour and 20 minutes late and the food is cold. She's not going to let that pass. <laughs> I guarantee you, that sweet lady you've seen around here can defend the line of respect very well. She will say to me, she won't get mad, she won't scream, she won't call me names, she won't say she's going home to her mother. Uh, but she will say, you know, that felt disrespectful to me. That I went to this trouble and you know I did it because I loved you and you didn't really care enough to call me. That bothered me. I hope you don't do that again. She's defending the line of respect. Now, uh, sometimes within the Christian concept, our understanding of what it means to love and to give and to hardly notice leads us to shove down great resentment and great anger over real wrongs that are being done. And when you do that, it stores. And I guarantee it's coming back. At some point, it will boil over and the acid, the bile that comes back will damage the relationship. Uh, I think it's a whole lot better, not because you've got rights. You know, a, lot, a lot of Christian speakers talk about the fact that you have no rights. I agree. God has all the rights. You don't have rights in marriage. But it's not that you're defending your rights. You're defending the relationship. What you have going together is important enough to say... That's not healthy to it. The things that Shirley and I tend to fight over are the things that one of us interprets as damaging to the relationship. And we'll say, hey, I can't let that pass. That's not good. And you get it out and it's over and we go on and it's forgotten. Managing this kind of anger, managing irritation is one of the fine arts of marriage. You, if you can get that done, you're doing fine. Yes? How do you feel that the feminist movement has affected men and women and their relationships and marriages of today? Uh, there have been some good aspects to it. Any sweeping movement like that has some positive sides. Uh, I have seen women at Children's Hospital in USC when I was there in the mid-60s who were taken lightly, who were spoken of derogatorily, uh, you know, who uh, were subjected to sexual harassment, genuine sexual harassment who were not promoted when they really should have been because they really had the talent, uh, but they were women, therefore they were handicapped. So there were some wrongs that needed to be righted. But by far, the most important influence has been negative and I think destructive to the family because they've made men and women antagonists. They've made us angry at one another. They've made, us, they've made women resent their husbands. I think that many, many divorces have come right out of feminist ideology. I think they've also denigrated the role of the homemaker. Boy, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, yea, thousands of years, women did not have to apologize because they wanted to raise children full time. Not every woman has to do that. You guys may not choose to do that, but if you do, I hope you feel respected in it. And I hope you feel like society says, that's all right. I counseled a young lady uh, some time ago who came to see me because she didn't know what she wanted to do with her life. She was graduating from Cal State LA and she just said, you know, I don't, there's nothing I want. I don't want any career. I'm not looking for it. She looked around as though there was somebody behind her. She looked around like this and she said, kind of leaned forward and she said, can I really be honest with you? I said, my goodness, Debbie, of course. There's nobody here but us. She said, I don't really want a career at all. I want to be a wife and mother. I said, why do you have to say it that way? Why do you have to put it in terms that somehow that's disrespectful? She said, are you kidding me? 
She said, if, if I went back to Cal State and I told my advisor and my friends and my fellow students that I majored with, if I, if I told them that's what I wanted to do, they'd laugh me out of school. I resent that. That has been an impact of the feminist movement. I think that's a disaster. I heard of a 12-year-old boy who never spoke a word. 12 years, never a word. And his uh, parents were very frustrated, and they just couldn't get him to talk. One day he was sitting at the table. His mother put the food on the table, and he suddenly pushed the plate aside, and he said, I am not eating this slop. <laughs> and the parents were ecstatic. They jumped up, and they ran around, and they said, Johnny, we didn't know you could talk. You've never said a word before. How come? He said, up to now, everything's been okay. <laughs> Uh, I hope that you guys will not have that problem in uh, communicating with your wives. Let's call it quits here, and we'll come back and take another run at it tonight. Thank you.